Happy 25th anniversary to the classic Dark Forces 2 expansion. When I last spoke about the Jedi Knight series, I spoke about the innovative, expansive sequel to Dark Forces. Looking at how they moved the series forward was super impressive. It turned from a Doom-like shooter into a massive game with open levels. It was truly incredible, and the game was released in the 90s. I was surprised how much Dark Forces 2 wowed me, despite the span of time. When I truly sat down to play it, it was an amazing experience. Not without a few problems like crashes, but still an impressive game. Just like the first game, it definitely deserves a remake. What I wanted to talk about next was the expansion to Dark Forces 2, titled Mysteries of the Sith. If you know me, you know that what are stories but mystery boxes. That's why Mysteries of the Sith drew me in from title alone. The Sith at this point of Star Wars history was a noteworthy faction in the expanded universe. And many would know Darth Vader was a Lord of the Sith, but it wasn't until The Phantom Menace until the mainstream knew what the Sith were as a whole. They appeared in stories like Tales of the Jedi, for example, but face it, before 1999, most people had no idea what the Sith were. Does this game elaborate on the Sith? Well, not really actually. It's the sort of game where the title is meant to contrast with the original game. The base game was referred to as Jedi Knight, so of course, it makes a lot more sense to make the expansion about the Sith somewhat. The expansion this time around stars not just Karl Katarn, but also Mara Jade. Now I've spoken about how so far, I've been underwhelmed by Mara Jade. The only thing that she was in that I've read as of the recording of this video was the Thrawn trilogy. I've been told that she gets a lot of character development in a lot of the later novels, but I'm not at that point yet. I've also been told that this game takes place during the general events of Dark Empire, although that storyline is never referenced in this game. But the thing is, we know that Dark Empire was happening in unison with this given the timeline. With that being said, let's talk about it. Since Mara Jade is a playable character in this game, I suppose I was wrong about Cal Kestis being the first ginger protagonist in a Star Wars game. But regardless, did you have souls? The game as an expansion pack does exactly what an expansion is supposed to do, for the most part. There's tweaks and improvements to every aspect of the Dark Forces 2 experience. It isn't a huge step up to the series, like Jedi Outcast, so expect the relative same gameplay. Starting up the game, we're told in the opening title crawl, which again I miss heavily in Star Wars stories, that it's been five years since the Dark Jedi known as Jerek was defeated on Rusan. Afterwards, Karl Katarn has joined the New Republic, and continuing his pursuit as a Jedi, accompanying him is surprise surprise Mara Jade, a smuggler who was once an Emperor's hand, swayed away from the path by Luke Skywalker. Mara Jade is training under Kyle to become a Jedi. I presume I missed a book when it comes to Mara's Jedi training, but regardless, let's talk about the game extensively now. The story isn't really the focus of the Mysteries of the Sith expansion. Despite its simplistic nature, I quite enjoyed the Dark Forces 2 story. It was a simple, straight to the point game, full of the spirit that embodied the original trilogy, and following a bunch of the same tropes, with new characters of course. Here, the story doesn't really matter. If I had to describe the main focus, it would be the new levels and tweaks to the original game. To give you an idea, when we start the campaign, Kyle is training with Mara in a sparring match. Kyle, who sounds nothing like Jason Court from the last game, is replaced by the guy who was in the Spider-Man games for the PlayStation 1. That's quite an odd choice for Kyle Katarn. They nailed it when they got Jeff Bennett in Jedi Outcast and Jedi Academy, but here, I always thought that Reno Romano was way off when it came to Kyle Katarn, especially with the look and persona they set up definitively with Dark Forces 2. Now that I realize it, Kyle Katarn is literally the only returning character from the last game. Granted, most of the characters from Dark Forces 2 died. I mean, think about it. Kyle killed all seven of the Dark Jedi, except for Yun, but he still died anyways. The absence of Jan Oz is quite odd, but hey, it's not that big a deal. In the in-game animated cutscene, the frame rate is kind of iffy. 
I don't know what was going on there, but anyways, shortly after sparring, we get a disturbance. As always in a game, Carl and Mara are called off to the command center, where the commander tells them that the Imperials are attacking the base. The Imperials have the element of surprise, due to disguising their weapon with an asteroid. So it's up to Kyle to repel the attack with the others at the New Republic outpost. And with that, the first level begins, in which we play as Kyle. The level opens, and it's pure chaos. It's got the same sort of vibe as the mission in the first Halo game. We're under attack, the situation is urgent, and here we are to potentially turn the tide of the battle. So let's get in. You'll notice right away that they definitely made improvements to the engine and how levels play out in many ways. For example, you've actually got allies in this mission, that being the New Republic soldiers, and the level feels more real due to more interactivity. I mean, it's still a 90s video game, and nowhere as complex as, say, Red Dead Redemption 2. But the improvements are felt. For this level, you'll be killing stormtroopers all across the base. They've invaded all over, and you'll immediately notice that the levels are a lot more closed in than Dark Forces 2. I noticed I was getting shot at right away, and wasn't able to dodge attacks. I somewhat suspected this game was made a lot harder than Dark Forces 2, on purpose. I mean, that makes sense in a way. The expansion should add new stuff to everything, and maybe give us more of a challenge as a follow-up expansion. What's good is that you have mostly efficient force powers. All the basics are back, especially force jump and speed, which you'll need to bunny hop and zip around like a motherfucker. The enemies are still tough if you're not careful. I observed that even when I was taking on stormtroopers in an open space, I was forced to run around, as deflection is highly inefficient. There's plenty of collectibles too at the start, but they all become obsolete as the game goes on, especially at the end. I wouldn't say the difficulty is brutally unfair. I understand why it's this challenging early on, but believe me, this game will kick your ass in the final set of levels. The AI allies, to be honest, are kind of useless, but what I can say at least is that they don't die easily, unless you kill them yourself. But a rebel committing the villain kills his own men cliche is practically unheard of. Anyways, across the first level, you'll be slashing at stormtroopers, but your guns will come in handy for ranged attacks. As I said, Dodging is quite hard in the first level alone. We're even met with Scout Troopers, a new addition to the expansion that wasn't in the last game. We've got Standard Blaster Troopers and Rocket Troopers too. I recall one of the Rocket Troopers kept firing at me, regardless on whether or not themselves or other troopers were in the way. That's commitment. Our objectives are to kill Imperials wherever we find them. At one point the power partially shuts off, so we have to find the generator and turn it back on. After that, we gotta take an Imperial shuttle and use it to sneak onto the weaponized asteroid. Level design here is not too confusing. I at one point struggled to find the vent at the start of the level, but aside from that, I had no problems otherwise. Collectible keys are back, but in the first level, it wasn't hard to find. I should also mention that the game completely adjusts the weapon selection by allowing you to pick up two weapons on the same key. What I mean is that you can switch between two kinds of blaster pistols by pressing 2, if you're going off the game's default keyboard controls. Anyways, we capture the Imperial Shuttle, and Carl takes it up to an asteroid to neutralize the whole thing. A simple, get-in, self-destruct, Get out plan. I like it. It's around this time you'll get zero help from allies. I mean, without them, you're still a one-man army. The second level, as I discovered, is pretty tough, and it takes some thinking to solve. When we land on the asteroid, there's really two ways we can go about it. And the most spelled out path is full of lethal enemies that will drain your health. If you're a fast runner, it is possible to take them out, but then after that I became stuck. The enemies are still pretty tough but defeatable. The first bit of problem solving is unlocking a small security station with an Imperial inside. You're supposed to shoot a switch inside to get the door open. I managed to figure it out relatively easily, but it's probable to say that some players may become completely confused. It wasn't a hassle to me, 
but it might be to some. The room gives you security access to security cameras all across the first part of the game. After that though, and after discovering hidden collectibles and loot, I just became completely stuck. Until I noticed that at a distance, the door I was supposed to proceed through was open, but long before you can even get close, the door closes immediately. I figured out eventually that I was supposed to shoot at a distance at the switch to force the door open. This only happened because I was observant. Since I didn't really know how the camera sniper worked, I just used the blaster at my side. Problem solved. After maybe half an hour of being confused. Fun fact, I actually managed to figure out every single puzzle and progression of levels on my own, except for the very, very end. We'll talk about that later. Nevertheless, after killing some enemies, we come across a deep chasm in the asteroid. You fall off and you die. One thing I love about these early 90s, early 2000s games is that most of them make falling off quite daunting. It may be an advantage of primitive graphics, but hey, childhood game trauma is a thing for a reason. So uncivilized. Anyways, this part isn't too hard actually, in terms of navigation that is. You won't know where to go that quickly, but not too slowly either. It's around this part of the level where you'll be introduced to the almighty turret, which you can get on and mop the floor with those dirty Imperials. It would make a better challenge to just organically take them all out. But I'm glad they gave you some sort of convenience at some points. To progress to the next area, you'll see a turret shooting at you. It's impractical to jump across because there's a ray shield. Essentially, the turret can shoot at you, but you can't shoot at it. It just isn't fair. I shortly after used my problem solving skills to figure out that you're supposed to lure the turret to the angle where it's shooting at an explosive barrel near it, which will destroy the turret and the switch. Hard to think what would have happened if the switch wasn't canonically there, the rebel base would have been destroyed. I understand that canon in games back then was extremely loose, but sometimes I think about how game logic applies to how characters did certain things. Surprisingly, unlike Dark Forces 2, this expansion doesn't have a novelization, which would have explained things better. Figuring that part out, reinforcements show up after, in the form of a transport where some more stormtroopers shoot us. I assumed that I was supposed to jump on the transport and use it to lower myself down. When I got stuck on an elevator, I jumped down and clipped right through it. So at first I assumed it's just for show. But then some time later, I tried it again when I was at similar elevation to the transport, and I didn't fall to my death. What? Imagine if someone went through the same thing as me, and they assumed you can't jump on the transport at all? They'd spend their time wasting it on finding a different solution. Elevating down, after we kill the stormtroopers, we are met with another cutscene of Kyle being pursued by stormtroopers. They manage to knock Kyle off with a rocket, and he falls down. They proceed to report that the intruder has been eliminated. As such, nobody goes looking for Kyle. Rule of thumb. Always make sure that the target is dead, especially in a fictional story. This trope is quite common in everything. As a random example, when Syndrome thought that he killed Mr. Incredible after a scout drone did a brief scan. Well anyways, after the Imperials assume Kyle is dead, Kyle actually wakes up being unconscious for a bit, and spills one of his one-liners. Gravity is a harsh mistress. I was wondering how Flat Earthers explain gravity. Thanks for telling me, Kyle. The level is the sort where you need to figure out what to do. Basically, there's two directions you can go at the start, with a bunch of varying paths with the elevator and the like. There's classic locked doors and other stuff you'll easily miss. Like, for example, I didn't notice down this large elevator, I was supposed to hit a switch I didn't notice at all. While going over the footage, I was annoyed at myself that I didn't see it in my playthrough. One area, in fact, took a lucky guess to figure it out. There's also a part where you'll see an open door, but as soon as you approach it, it closes, and Carl remarks that he needs to find another way inside. The thing is though, the game was actively teasing you. I usually don't like it in games when an easy path is blocked off after it originally seemed that you could access it. It's one of my top 5 worst video game tropes. I'd say Fallen Order is the worst offender with it forcing you to get back up where you started on Dathomir, but one of the only things I dislike more is the trope where you have to defend something that can't defend itself, and has got a limited health bar. In a game, I usually want to take care of myself only, and not have 
stuff that forces you to manage all your effort in something that feels kind of pointless. Does Mysteries of the Sith have that? Thankfully not. I'm just demonstrating what I'm talking about. So with that being said, I don't have much more to say about this level. It's kind of confusing, but there's levels I disliked more in regards to level design. As such, let's talk about level 4. This is a level that requires fast reflexes and quick thinking. So across level 4 you'll be getting the asteroid to self-destruct. Before that though, we must traverse through areas that have every risk in the book. Deep falls, rocket troopers, etc. The game takes you everywhere and require you to hop like a bunny. As such, you'll probably make it through more stormtroopers before you realize you gotta go underwater. This mission in particular may actually be my favorite in the game. It's the perfect self-destruct sequence, at least in the 90s. When you go underwater, for example, you need to cut open some things so that the whole asteroid will initiate self-destruct. This is very trial and error. I doubt any player got it completely on the first playthrough blind. It's a good example of a good trial and error gameplay because it encourages you to realize your mistakes. And in each subsequent try, I made it further and further. You'll need to cut the cables to make the whole asteroid explode. Then you'll need to swim all across to this area, in which you need to pull two switches. When I got to this part, I wasted too much precious time and was forced to fix my mistake. I'm unsure how Karl Katarn managed to survive such a complicated level like this, but eventually I made it out of the water and had to jump multiple times. There's a part where you need to pull four switches really fast, and by the time I successfully beat the level, I only had two seconds to spare, according to the automated voice. With that being said, Kyle escapes the asteroid in time. At the New Republic base, Kyle speaks to Mara, discussing that he discovered leads to the planet Droman Kars, a planet I hear was featured in the Old Republic MMO. I presume this is its first appearance, and after looking it up, yeah it is. I'm thinking this is meant to contrast the Valley of the Jedi on Rusan, except there's a lot less context. Mara objects to Kyle going to Droman Kars and leaving her at the base, because she insists that she needs more training. Man, did Rey Skywalker get everything easily. All she had to do was believe in the Force. I will never stop ridiculing J.J. Abrams for that. It's here where you realize that the story doesn't matter. At first, you'll be assuming that the Republic base and the Imperial asteroid was meant to get you invested in the story. Think back to Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, for example. That film's opening had very little to do with the rest of the film, aside from setting up one of the villains. But that film's opening is revered by all. I may or may not be teasing a certain review before the Dial of Destiny comes out, but that's a discussion for another time. Point is though, the story of Mysteries of the Sith doesn't matter. The game is pretty much companion missions that tell three separate stories. Act 1 of this game was about an attack on a Republic base and destroying an asteroid. So what's Act 2 about? Well, something less interesting. Mara Jade is told by the Republic base commander that they need supplies, and they want to make a deal with Kapa the Hutt. The cutscene has an awkward transition where it cuts right to Mara Jade going to Kapar's palace on whatever planet and talking to that eyeball thing from Return of the Jedi, in which she's told that since she's now a Jedi, and Luke as a Jedi killed Jabba, she can kindly piss off. Kapar ain't interested in speaking to her at all. Since this is fiction, Mara decides she's gonna need to find another way in, and so, we transition to playing as Mara Jade. There are no more missions as Kyle Katarn. Scrat. Mara Jade of course has the same controls and moveset, being a player character. But the difference is, is that she has far less affinity in the Force. You'll quickly realize that Kyle was way more powerful and could pull off a lot more than Mara Jade could. It's here where you realize that it's going to become harder from that alone. But hey, we still got the Force. So what exactly is level 5 like? Well, after we're denied entrance, you have to locate a crack in one of the hills. Use the Force to jump up. Right from the offset, you'll come across Kapar's thugs and whatnot that carry different weapons from stormtroopers. In contrast with the last game, 
You are fighting thugs first, and stormtroopers second. Anyways, you'll find that after jumping around, that there's another way in, but the door's locked. Within a minute, I figured out that you were supposed to slash at the equipment, so the mechanics would open the door to fix it. That's your ticket in. You see, it's stuff like this that isn't overtly hard to figure out what to do, that I wish earlier 90s video games did. So I applaud the game in this instance for coming up with a solvable problem that doesn't take you 5 hours to figure out. Regardless, that's your ticket in. The next area of the game is essentially what I think are living quarters. It's around here that it's not just bastards with bowcasters you have to deal with. You'll also need to fight grenade enemies, people who go up up and personal, and normal blaster enemies. And it's not very easy to deflect or dodge fire in this game. Explosions usually go far enough where you'll be hit in one way or another. Grenade enemies are the most annoying. They can wipe away your health instantly. With that being said, after navigating the living quarters, which might look confusing, but is surprisingly simple, you'll come across another droid telling you to piss off. You can tell that that is the way to progress. So you are forced to get some kind of disguise or some way to trick the eyeball. So what you're supposed to do is locate a Tusken Raider disguise elsewhere and use that to trick the eyeball. <laughs> this level so far is pretty cool with its problem solving. For most of the level, you'll be shooting all who stand between you and the hut. Sometimes the difficulty can be damn hard, but it feels like more of that trial and error gameplay I talked about. I had to scavenge for supplies and be selective and precise with enemy encounters. You'll also do some swimming and basically inching closer and closer to Kapa the hut. The puzzle solving is evident, but never did it become blatantly impossible or unfair. So thus far, level navigation and enemies are pretty decent. I like this expansion pack so far. The level ends by finding a pack of explosives and placing them on top of a dome directly above where Kapa hangs out in his palace. Overall, good level but the navigation after this point becomes a hassle. Mara Jade barges into Kapar's throne room, and all is resolved when Kapar says he'll give supplies to the New Republic if Mara becomes his temporary errand girl and does a task for him. The hut's rival, some dude named Takara, has stolen some surveillance equipment from him, and he needs it back. Get it back and he'll supply the New Republic. Simple and easy, but first, you have to locate Takara's lieutenant. That takes you to a planet named Katrasi, in which you'll start off in a spaceport. A good improvement over Dark Forces 2 is not punishing you for killing civilians. There are a lot, and you can kill as many as you want without consequence. There is no light or dark side ending. It's just a rigid story, which is fine. Figuring out where to go and what to do is quite confusing. I think it has something to do with how many different areas there are, and progressing only happens properly when you search around. As a positive, what's cool about this level is provided you don't blow your cover with a lightsaber or whatever, stormtroopers will just ignore you. This doesn't mean, however, that thugs won't ambush you. They certainly will and you'll be forced to deal with at least a dozen of them. Among your objectives is switching off something in one of the hangars, and with this level, I honestly lost track. Going over the footage really did not refresh my memory, because it took me a long time in my original playthrough to figure out where the hell to go. It's here where the game becomes confusing to navigate, which is a shame, because the game was damn good so far, and I didn't encounter much problems, aside from rough difficulty. I also remember going into a cantina, but getting lost for a while after that. Eventually though, you'll gain entrance to the next level through means I can't remember. And now we're on to a familiar looking, but more straightforward level. That doesn't mean there's no confusing navigation, because there certainly is. Anyways, with that brief summary, let's get on to the next level. In the next level, you'll have a relatively simple time with navigation for at least the first five minutes of playing, but eventually, you get stuck. Since there's some sort of crash land speeder blocking the way, you'll need to find another way around. So what do you do? That's what I asked myself for at least half an hour, before I realized I missed a vent hidden behind a slope. It's so slight though, that I wonder how the hell I was supposed to know it was there. 
I think the slope should have been removed so that more players would be able to see it. That's my criticism for this part of the level. After you figure out the way, you're on to the other side of this level, and you also have to deal with stormtroopers too. One area is basically a war zone. The stormtroopers with their rocket launchers and the Trandoshan thugs with their concussion rifles. It's a nightmare. Like, I know the Empire probably doesn't care about civilian casualties, but what about collateral damage? I'd also like to mention there's a neat easter egg where we see the Millennium Falcon. Since this takes place the same year as Dark Empire, maybe this is where the Falcon was before Dark Empire. I have no idea what Han, Leia, and Chewie were doing on Katrasi, but I guess it doesn't matter. There's a bit of problem solving around this area that isn't too hard, like activating a land speeder to use as an elevator to jump up, where it'll take you to the rooftops. This takes you to the final area, and damn do they spam the enemies all over, don't they? Like there's this one part after getting a key, you'll open a door, and whoa! Concussion blasts in your face and you're dead. There's no way to dodge that, it's a beginner's trap. After that though, you fall into a trap and you're captured, where you wake up in the most filthiest, most unsanitary prison cell. You're stuck, you're trapped, so how do you escape? You use force pull to grab the key from a Gomorian guard. This took me around 2 minutes to figure out. Since you have no weapons, getting your weapons back is a hassle, because you'll need to avoid Gamorian guards, and also other prisoners. I have been told that the prisoners can be used as a distraction to attack the guards, but since they attack you too, I found little use with them. Basically, you'll need some tools to open up a water pipe. You want to know where this leads? No, seriously, I'll let you have a guess. It's a giant rancor, of course. It's here where you'll force pull your lightsaber towards you. But if you try to attack the rancor, odds are that you'll just get eaten. And there's no way to break free. I had to exploit the game to get free hits on him. Until he finally died. Then you're allowed access to the next area. But seriously... How was the average player in the 90s supposed to get past this? After this, you basically have to get some shenanigans in what looks like a sci-fi sea dock. It's here where you'll steal the surveillance equipment in question, and then you can finally escape the area. Then it's the start of the next story in the game. Basically, we're on a New Republic ship and we're escorting a Jedi holocron. But of course, some pirates have to show up in an attempt to board us, starting the next level. With that being said, it's a pretty impressive level. The set pieces are excellent. It's a very creative level. It's basically a more primitive version of the Pillar of Autumn, or Cairo Station from the Halo games. I always enjoy boarding action in games. Your allies, though, are pretty useless. Noteworthy parts of this level include a bridge that you're supposed to cut the beams for, but I didn't realize that, so I wasted 15 minutes before I thought of that. Aside from that, my favorite part of the level has to be fighting pirates with zero gravity. That was a lot of fun, but it's near the end of the damn level. We hide inside a crate and use that to sneak on board the pirate ship. But damn was this one of the most confusing out of all the levels. Like seriously, at my most confused, it took me what felt like an hour. Although it was only 15 minutes to figure out that I was supposed to destroy something, to get a door open. I was damn near close to giving up though. After taking a ship to the pirate base, I got to say, this might be one of the most visually appealing levels in the game. The level was expansive, yet not confusing, with a lot of puzzle solving challenges, including jumping across large boxes that appear out of water in this area, and having to jump across to progress. And if you screw up, you gotta do it all over again. It's here where you'll come across easter eggs from the previous games, like the Dark Trooper Helmet and AT-88, before we steal the Holocron and make our grand escape, which is pretty fun. I opted to use force speed to zip past the enemies and find our transport and escape. With that being said, we're on to the third act. Mon Mothma contacts Mara Jade and tells us that Carl's gone missing and he's out of contact. So Mara Jade goes to Drome and Cast to find him. So the title of the game is coming full circle. Except there's no mystery to be solved. Almost like JJ's mystery box. The box is going to have to be opened eventually. So basically, we land on this random swamp on said planet. You'll realize right away that none of your external weapons work, which makes the game extraordinarily harder. 
For most of the game, relying on ranged weapons was sort of part of the gameplay, but now that it's gone, you've only got your lightsaber. This area is supposed to be the super ancient and mysterious place, but making the weapon short out was a mistake. You have to rely on external weapons in certain situations, but now that it's gone, I spent the first 15 minutes figuring out how to get past the statue. I at first assumed that you had to jump up across branches, but nope, that does nothing. And if you fall down, you die, as always. After wasting a lot of my time, I realized you were supposed to trick the statue by using force persuasion to make yourself invisible and allow yourself to pass. But if you thought it was gonna get any simpler, the nightmare has only just begun. You'll come across so many enemies that drain your damn health like a motherfucker. I was forced to use quick save to pick off the enemies one by one, which I hate when I have to do that. After the enemies are wiped away, you're faced with more puzzles. Figuring out was near impossible, but somehow I did, and you come face to face with a dark version of Mara Jade. It's supposed to be some spooky dark half of yourself. I presume this planet has the same effect the Dagobah cave has. Defeating the dark half of yourself is a bitch. You have to jump around, dodge the lightning, and other stuff in general, but eventually you'll come across the temple to progress. Yes. Based on what we described, that's only the beginning. The only way I could survive between areas was by hiding or by claiming the high ground. Another thing to note is that force heal is slow to recharge. So you'll have to wait like 30 seconds or something to use it again. It's ridiculous. It would be nice to have blasters, but that would even out the difficulty. But of course this game at this stage does not hesitate, nor does it show any mercy or forgiveness. The game became pretty frustrating in the climax. Being at a major disadvantage by removing external weapons, again, made the game artificially harder. This level is enemy after enemy, all of which drained your health in two seconds. Eventually, you come across Kyle, who has fallen to the dark side, and we must pursue him. The difficulty goes totally off the rails if it hadn't already, by barraging you with even more enemies, and involving even more complicated puzzles. Seriously, don't you think it was already hard enough? I was forced to pretty much avoid all the enemies, or use alternate tactics like hiding, or the high ground. Again, to keep myself alive. Eventually we come across Kyle, and he offers us a choice, but again, since this game only has one ending, Mara of course refuses. It would be kind of cool if you could choose, but hey, it didn't necessarily need it. And here we come across the toughest boss fight that can be defeated in an easy way, but not a way the game tells you. You want to know something about this boss fight? I spent an hour straight trying to defeat Kyle, but he just kept healing myself. I forced myself to hide and strike at him over and over again, and he never came anywhere close to dying. To be fair, the game does give some sort of clue on what you're supposed to do by showing a figure on the wall with a deactivated lightsaber, but most players would only assume that's for decoration. Basically what you're supposed to do is deactivate your lightsaber, something you would only figure out if you accidentally hit the button, because you've relied on your lightsaber the whole playthrough and never had to change it. How was anyone supposed to figure that out though? Anyways, Carl realizes he can't strike Mara down, so they leave together on the ship. That ending was sort of underwhelming, but since the story isn't a focus, I guess that brings us to the conclusion. As an expansion, it isn't as long or fulfilling as Dark Forces 2. It strips away a compelling story, but in return we get an improved engine that allows for more opportunities and levels. As such, it's a decent expansion. An easy 7 out of 10. But what holds it back are of course confusing level design and hard enemies, especially at the end. I can forgive most other encounters because they at least they give you more weapons at your disposal, but removing usable weapons was a mistake. Despite that, Mysteries of the Sith is a fun time if you were a fan of Dark Forces 2. If not, you should probably skip this game. It kind of sucks that there was a lacking story, and it's basically just side quests, but as an expansion, that's mostly forgivable. I still yearn for a remake of both Dark Forces games plus the Mysteries of the Sith expansion. Maybe there that we can get said problem solved. 
I'm happy to recommend Mysteries of the Sith, but be aware that it's a cautious recommend. If you don't like confusing levels or insane difficulty, Mysteries of the Sith may not be for you. But I still think it's worth celebrating the game's 25th anniversary. Now, before I close this video, I should address the secret level that's hidden in the game. It's a level that recreates Episode 5's climax on Cloud City. Honestly, just like the multiplayer, I didn't actually play it. Why? Well, I kind of felt like I was done with the game after Droman Cast gave me so much shit. I might cover the multiplayer if there's enough demand for it, and I'll be sure to talk about the best spin bonus level. Or maybe it'll be a YouTube short. I have heard the game was somewhat rushed, but regardless, Star Wars Jedi Knight Mysteries of the Sith is a decent expansion that despite its lacking story, its plot points were used for the Old Republic MMO at least. That is my complete review on Mysteries of the Sith. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories about mystery boxes? Under the mountain.